technologies. He has now his own company. And he will talk in a very concrete way of how we could use algorithm to foster democracy and to foster quality journalism. So please welcome with a big applause, Krishna Bharat. Thank you. What a fabulous venue. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm a computer scientist by training. For the last 20 years, I've been working with online news using computers. And I've also been working with people who are intensely involved with news in one capacity or the other. Uh, so I was at Google. And in 2015, I left Google. And since then, I've been independent. I teach at Stanford. I'm no longer affiliated with Google. And I'm able to observe this intersection between technology and journalism from some kind of a neutral perspective with my uh, unique history. And, you know, it gives me goosebumps to be here, to be here in the city that invented democracy. Uh, that ancient system of governance that is still, I think, the best, one of the best things the world has. Uh, it's, with all its faults, um, with all its messiness, and the fact that it's under attack now um, by disinformation and dictators and uh, populists who would like to destroy the institutions that underpin it, it is still surviving. And it is something that I would like to protect. And it gives me, it's an honor to he be here to talk about defending democracy, protecting democracy, and strengthening the core of democracy with you via journalism. And, and if you think about it, it's the only system of government where the public can control their own destiny, can fire the government if they're not happy with them, and install a new one. And it requires two things. One is free and fair elections, and the other is an informed public who actually know what's happening in their community, in their city, in their country, in the world and understand the issues that are actually impacting them, and learn to ignore the issues that are not impacting them. And in order to do this, they depend on you. You are what provide them the information that they allow them to make the right decision about who to elect. And that's why the, the work we do here in this room is so important. How does, that's why we've talked a lot about how AI is part of the problem, how AI can actually subvert democracies, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But today I'm mainly here to talk about what AI can do positively for democracy. And to give you a small example of that from my own history, in Google News, we use AI to bring news from around the world to a single place where you can browse multiple perspectives, maybe an Arab and an Israeli perspective on an issue, um, or from Washington Post and Fox News. And the advantage of bringing news from around the world, from different perspectives, to one place is that it makes the process of reading broadly very efficient. So you encourage people to read broadly. It allows any falsehood from one source to be contradicted by other sources. And also allows you to understand the different narratives so that you can step back and observe the story independent of any one narrative because individual narratives can be deceptive. So even though a publisher is not lying to you, they can give you a selective view of the truth. They can say it looks like a circle, or they can say it looks like a square, but in fact, in reality, you step back, you see it's different. It looks like a cylinder. And ultimately, this, I think this is what Google News accomplishes. It creates a more informed public. It ultimately protects democracy. But Google News cannot do more than what the media is providing. So having a healthy media ecosystem is super important. And having the media cover the right things in the right way is also super important. So this is what I'm going to talk about. One thing we are fighting against is two million years of evolutionary baggage. For the last two million years, we've lived as, in small communities as hunter-gatherers in a small geographical neighborhood where we knew everybody. And we had very few inputs. And somebody told you they saw leopard tracks, and two people told you that, you assumed there is a leopard around. And you were probably right. 
picked up your spear. Now somebody tells you that in Mexico there are gangs, or something else is happening somewhere else in the world. People in small town America get very afraid, even though it has nothing to do with them. It's not relevant to them, and they have never met a Mexican. Um, what I'm trying to tell you is that, that in the two million years, as our brain evolved, it learned to use very few inputs in both theories, assuming that those inputs are actually accurate. The last 10,000 years since farming, and we started living in larger communities, and we've become more globalized, and we're getting inundated with news and misinformation, and people have fought with devious agendas, our hardware has not been upgraded. We're still running that same brain that used to make, that was doing the right thing in the former environment. So just like in any AI system, the inputs you give decide what model gets built. So this is where I think we have an incredible responsibility. As journalists, our responsibility is to help our public build a true and accurate model of the world they live in. A true and accurate model that they can use to make judgments. And in part, this is skewed because of misinformation, but it can also be skewed because of what we cover, the choices we make. So to illustrate this, I'm gonna show you uh, this chart. On the left are the things that are actually killing Americans, heart disease, cancer, road accidents, and so forth. Terrorism is vanishingly small. Now here are the two of the sources I trust most in the world, New York Times and Guardian. Over a 17 year period, they discovered that the coverage of terrorism was 35% relative to the others. Why, why is this happening? It's because they're responding to a market need. If it bleeds, it leads. It's also easier to cover than healthcare. You know, to, to, to the, the healthcare narrative is complicated. It requires extensive analysis. Terrorism is easier to cover. But it also makes terrorism more likely to cover it. So if you have a problem here, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, is good in the short run for the publisher, but it's terrible for democracy. So the way to fix this is twofold. We have to strengthen the immune system of democracy by fighting back against misinformation that comes from AI. We also have to strengthen the core of journalism by making it cost effective to do solid journalism at a low price with the help of technology. Okay, so what, is, what might that involve? But, but first, let's talk about how AI distorts reality. You've seen many examples of this, and maybe some solutions here in this conference. Um, OpenAI has a text generator that can create fake news at will. Uh, faces on the internet may not be real people. You can manufacture people. You can also fake video, deep fakes. You can also change the speech that somebody uttered. All of this is happening and will happen because a lot is riding on this. There's a lot of money chasing it. Uh, and you know it would happen whether or not there was AI. People will figure out a way to do it, right? And a case study on this was the Indian election that just happened. It's been called the WhatsApp election. India is the biggest market for WhatsApp. I think there are 250 million subscribers. And it was widely reported that in this opaque network, there were a lot of memes flowing that were patently false. Candidates being accused of saying things they did not say. Uh, communal violence being created, and so on and so forth. And not necessarily with sophisticated technology, but it's gonna get worse. Um, and the part of the problem is a large part of India is illiterate, and access to high bandwidth has suddenly leapt in the last five years. It went from 125 million to 512 million broadband users. So people who have never been exposed to the internet for the first time are getting broadband, image memes and video memes. And our evolutionary uh, baggage says, seeing is believing. If somebody shows it to you, it doesn't matter who the messenger is, you have to believe it because you see it. And if we fall for it, these people certainly will fall for it. And it's extremely cost effective to program the public this way uh, for milli cents per citizen. So this is, this is the problem we are facing. Of course, there are ways to tackle this using technology. 
So on a social network, the best way to fight false news, false memes, is to actually have the company that owns the network and has kind of the God's eye view of what's happening, look at the data and build the models on top of it. So in this example, if somebody propagated a meme and it took two different paths through the network, that meme, substantially the same way, is going to be propagated by a number of people. And having observed this and realized that all of these paths, in fact, represent the same payload, and looking at the rate at which that payload is being distributed, the social network can actually detect that something is happening, especially if, if the people who are forwarding it are the people who forwarded false news in a, in a previous instance. It doesn't matter whether it is a text, uh, a, a textual article, or it's a video, or it's an image. Just observing the pattern of sharing and the rate at which it's being spread, and the fact that credible sources are not spreading it, allows an AI model to detect that this is, this is suspicious. Of course, AI models cannot take decisions on their own. They might slow this down, but ultimately you have to go to fact checkers to resolve this. And again, technology can help with fact checking. I'm sure there are lots of examples here um, in the past, but it comes down to either extracting claims or verifying whether this video happened before or looking at other attributes of the video or image that uh, tell you whether this was true or fake. But it is an arms race, even as AI starts finding ways to, to debunk these things, there's going to be an increased effort to try and, and, and manufacture them in a way that cannot be debunked. So this is a huge problem. The other challenge we have is that in WhatsApp, as we saw, the, the network is opaque. That means even Facebook cannot see what's being sent. But frankly, if something is being shared by you know, 10,000 people or 100,000 people, you know, it's hard to argue that it's private information. It's, at some point, it has to cross the limit where we have to say, Facebook, this is public. Let's take a look at it. Let's figure out if it's misinformation. Let's stop it. Um, as we saw in that previous example, there are signals that tech platforms have that they, only they have. And these can be used to protect democracy, to support journalism, if there's collaboration between tech platforms and, and the, the civil society. So I'm going to ask the question, can we do this in other instances? Um, newsrooms lack the capacity right now to build, to do original research in AI. So most of it comes from technology companies. And they're not necessarily de developing it with journalism in mind, but if we ask for the right artifacts, and if we apply it correctly, perhaps we can take what's already being developed and make it very effective for journalism. So let's talk about enabling civil discourse. Okay, so in order to engage the public, we have to listen to the public, but the public, it's not clear who the public is because the common threads, social networks are full of monsters. We don't know who's behind the mask and whether they're real or whether they're robots. Um, one of the best things about the internet is that everybody has a voice. Everybody can be heard. The tragedy of the internet is everybody has a voice. And everybody wants to be heard. And in particular, there are monsters, there are manipulators, there are marketers. And they have a louder voice than anybody else. So ordinary people who have something to contribute, who you want to connect with, are no longer able to be heard. And this is a problem. If you, if you cannot connect with your audience, you have a problem. Uh, some people have suggested that identity is a solution, but identity can be manufactured. It's not necessary. And some of, and many people are now reluctant to reveal who they are because of harassment and other reasons. So I would argue that what we want is authenticity. What is authenticity? It's knowing that this person is a real person. They actually exist. It's knowing something about them. It's knowing where they, whether they are live in the geographical area we're talking about. Whether, what their political persuasion is, and so on and so forth. Things they want to reveal about themselves that convince us that this person needs to be heard. So in this comment thread on, on Brexit, you know, you will encounter a lot of opinions. It's hard to know who is real and who is a troll, right? But if you give the audience the opportunity to, to state who they are and have it be proven, then you have a different view. 
So if the AI is able to help this person say, I'm a real person, I'm a UK resident, I'm a woman, then I want to listen to her. I don't want to listen to all the other people who may or may not be real, who may or may not be local, whose perspectives may be concocted to manipulate me. Right? This is kind of what I want to achieve. But can we do this? Of course we can. Because the kinds of information we're talking about already exist. I carry around a phone with me all the time. The accounts I have with Amazon, with Google, with Facebook have been there for you know, decades. So surely they know me. In fact, they do. And I should be able to assert that I'm a real person. Right? They know my name. They know my location. They know my gender. They know my interests. And beyond that, they know a lot more that they could compute using AI models if they wanted to. My friends, my, my work, my education, my politics, my religion, my marital status, what kinds of things I purchase, my ethnicity, and also my interactions online, whether I'm polite, whether I'm a troublemaker, whether I'm obnoxious. Um, so if they already know this, and they know this because they use it to market things to me, they use it to drive messages to me, why not empower me to use this to my advantage? So consider this woman, right? People are already targeting her with messages because she's a woman, because she lives in Texas, because she's Catholic, because she's Republican. It's already happening. Why not give her the opportunity to lean in and say, hey, I have something to say. And here are the things I want to be able to assert about myself so that I can listen to her and respect her. Now, there are many ways to implement this, and I'm not going to talk about them. But ultimately, it comes down to an alliance between technology companies and publishers to figure out how to empower the audience to connect better with journalists, right? Using the, using the signals that the tech companies already have. The same kind of knowledge and collaboration can allow for advanced forms of personalization. So, you know, imagine that your Swiss info in Switzerland, you're, you're talking to what you think is the Swiss audience about cancer, right? But you could have a much more subtle logic here in how to generate this article. If somebody's in Switzerland, they have one title. If they're not in Switzerland, they have a different title. If they're male, you insert statistics about prostate cancer. If female, you talk about breast cancer statistics. This is some work we did at Stanford uh, with uh, journalists from TA Media, and it's incredibly effective. You could also do this for, to, to, for a geographical neighborhood, because that's something that can be automatically customized. As you syndicate content out, you could localize it to a given neighborhood based on attributes of that audience. Um, one AI technology I am super excited about, I think it's going to revolutionize our field, is speech. Our ability to understand what is being spoken, our ability to manufacture speech. Uh, some of you may have seen Google I.O. Sundar Pichai showed an example of the Google Assistant where the Google Assistant was able to talk to a hairdresser, book an appointment, and make very natural conversation, and the other person did not even know they were talking to AI. Right? And the advantage of having AI be able to listen to our conversation as, as journalists talking to a source and participate is that now you have a, you have a buddy. You have a buddy who has access to the world's information and, and, and tell you in real time what's, what you should know. Right? So transcription services are becoming better. So you, here you have an example of uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates being interviewed. And I've been watching the transcript. It's been getting better over the years. Imagine a situation where this transcript is being created in real time in a super accurate way with lots of annotations. Um, yes. The time is coming. Um, accuracy, you know, in laboratory conditions is coming up to take 95%, which is kind of what you would expect from a layman listening to a conversation. Uh, in, in, in field testing, it's somewhat lower. But it is going to get better. And one way in which we as humans are able to follow what's happening is by understanding the domain. I'm, I'm going to talk later about how AI can improve speech recognition accuracy. But 
there are many exciting things that this can enable. One thing it can do is when you shoot a video and you want to turn that into something that you want to then broadcast, you can take the transcript as a starting point and edit it in a very lightweight way and produce derivative video clips or audio clips very quickly. And th this is something that folks at Stanford have been working on, and it's, it, 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 it's, it's impressive what it can do. Another thing it can enable, the Google I.O. demo I was talking about, is scalable interviews. Right? There's a lot of shoddy journalism where people talk to five or 10 people and say, hey, I have a theory about how this is working. Right? But to, to really understand healthcare, to really understand Brexit, uh, Yellow West, you have to talk to tens of thousands of people. And it's not cost effective to do that. But perhaps AI can help, right? So you can imagine a situation where an AI person on your phone is able to talk to you, interview you, and based on what you say, is able to tailor the conversation so that they get the most out of the interview, right? It's, it's, it's low friction, can be compelling, and in the limit, it can be actually a form of entertainment. Talking to this AI assistant that is quite responsive, that is able to make conversation with you and give you feedback. So getting feedback from a million people may be possible in a cost-effective way you know, in a decade from now. Another thing I'm excited about is the possibility of what I call a reporter's notebook 2.0. Yeah? For the longest time, we've still been taking notes the same way. We've still been getting inputs from our sources the same way. Why can't AI make a difference? And of course it can. It can transcribe the conversation instantly, as you saw. Uh, it can take documents using OCR and convert that into text. It can tag speakers, it can translate, it can provide context. It can resolve names and connect them to other things that you know in your organization. It can connect them to things in the external world. It can find relationships. All of these things are very easy to do in the near term. There's even a project at Google called uh, Backlight that is doing some of this. Longer term, we can do very powerful things like Automatic summarization to produce different versions of what is being said so that you can uh, pass it on to other people. You can find related content. You can identify claims and you can fact check those claims in real time and respond to the person you're talking to immediately. You can answer questions. Uh, the system can answer questions to you and that you don't know the answers to, but maybe it's out there. You can even suggest questions to ask the person you're talking to. So I imagine a situation in the future where you're interviewing somebody, and you're wearing something that is talking to your phone, and the AI, edge AI on your phone, is able to listen to the conversation, and is able to provide you inputs in real time. You know, five years ago, she actually said the opposite. This is what she said. Ask her the question right away, right? So this is the promise. Um, lastly, let me talk about what it means to bring AI into the workforce. And some of you are, have real-time experience, in the, uh, have, have real-world experience in this. You've actually installed AI in a newsroom, but I want us to think a little bit further and think about what it really means. Computing in the past was about bringing in a machine that did one specific thing, but now it's much more like bringing in an employee, somebody who is a knowledge worker, who has superpowers and, will, and is a specialist in a specific area, and you want to lean on them every now and then to get something done, or you want to use them to scale your efforts, right? And part of that is Coming in, as employees do, they don't understand everything about your business. You know, the AI models that get built outside have to be fine-tuned in your environment to work in your domain, to do the things that you want, to perform the tasks you want. So this requires a special kind of skill in the newsroom, which you may or may not have yet, and it's something you ought to think about. Uh, you can also build AI models to train AI models. So if you want to extract tables from scanned documents, right? Well, one way to do that is to have an AI that produces artificial scanned documents that have tables in them that trains the other system. And the trainer and the trainee can be sa trained simultaneously. Uh, other thing we can do is combine learnings that come from many sources. Uh, the technology companies are building in edge AI into phones so that they can pick up on a number of signals and learn about things that are specific to that user and can also enhance the global model. And one question to ask the technology companies is if they're building it for themselves, why not have publishers also participate? Um, lastly, I want to say, 
teaching AI systems about our domain is kind of an unknown space. You know, we're starting to make some progress in that. An example of this is if you think about Robert Mueller, who's investigating the Russia uh, interference in the elections, you would imagine that in his head or in a whiteboard, there was some kind of mind map that said, this is what happened, here's how people are connected. Every journalist has a mind map like this about the story they're pursuing. Now imagine combining the mind maps of all journalists, not just living, but also the ones that published in the past. What kind of incredible resource could that be and how might we use that, right? Something like this is already happening, right? People are building um, AI systems based on all the content in Wikipedia, all the news archives, legal archives, scientific papers, and so forth. And there is an incredible wealth of knowledge that's now baked into these neural networks that come from work that's been done in the past, right? And they can be used to transform content based in, in a very domain-specific way, like transcription that I mentioned earlier. It can also be used as a form of associative memory. If you go to a veteran journalist and you ask them about a name, they will, not only will they understand who that person is and tell you a lot about them, it can also give you a lot of connections and related objects, that, that, that artifacts. The same thing is now possible with language embeddings. So you, you can take all this content, throw it in, throw all the documents you have in your system, and then you can ask a question about some connection or some, some person or some organization, and just like our human associative memory works, this organizational associative memory can give you a number of related things that you didn't know existed. Imagine what the resources can be in the state of journalism. Um, at Stanford, I'm part of something called the Journalism and Democracy Initiative, and we're starting to look at how computing can be used in every stage of this process, right? From sourcing from various uh, avenues, uh, online and offline, uh, analysis, trying to derive a story from it, uh, trying to produce artifacts that you can share uh, at cost effectively to different uh, platforms and different channels to distribute this uh, in a sensible, in, in a, in a uh, optimal way, uh, you know, to, to fund it, uh, and, and also finally to look at the uh, environment and understand how journalism is impacting the world and the world is impacting journalism. So to summarize, I think journalism is like the backbone of democracy. Yeah? And if you're in the business of helping people build a true and accurate picture of the world they live in, not a distorted one, not one where things far away look like they're close by, then you are supporting democracy. Otherwise, you're in the entertainment business. And I think there are many ways in which AI, which has been a threat to democracy, can be turned around and used to both defend democracy via the, an immune response by finding, finding misinformation and stopping it and debunking it, but also strengthening the core practice of democracy, uh, of journalism, which is to do an in-depth analysis that allows you to give a true and accurate narrative not something that's facile and easy to generate. Lastly, I think you should think really hard about what the next decade is going to mean as digital employees come into newsroom. Not to take away jobs from journalists, but actually to give them superpowers, to be a buddy, to be a resource. And how are they going to be integrated? How are they going to be trained? Will the large newsrooms have all the benefits? Will the small newsrooms fall behind? These are huge questions. And I think it's, it's uh, time to start thinking about what exactly it means to bring AI into your newsroom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know that you will have the opportunity to have uh, more questions and uh, close contact with uh, Krishna just right now or in a while uh, at, the, at, the, at the lighthouse. So if you have more questions, I'm sure you have, you will meet Krishna in a while in the white lighthouse. Thank you, Kamrat.